ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮರನ್ನಸಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಸಾರಿ ಫಾರ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಲೈಟ್ ವಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಕೇಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಗೂಗಲ್ ಇನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಸಮ್ ಗ್ರೂಪ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ದೇರ್ ಲಿಲ್ ಕೀರ್ತನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಆನ್ longer than we expected it was very nice and yesterday also we were at salesforce downtown san francisco and found that in their skyscraper buildings there every floor has a meditation room so the founder of that organization is very interested in higher consciousness We've been reading online in anticipation of the appearance day of Lord Ramachandra. And last night, we completed chapter number 10 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, ninth canto. And now we're taking up with the reading of the chapter entitled, Lord Ramachandra Rules the World. That's ninth canto, eleventh chapter. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya narayanam namaskritya naram jayava narottamam devim sarasatim vyasam tato jayam udiraye shukadev goswami said thereafter the supreme personality of god had lord ramachandra accepted an acharya and performed sacrifices yagyas with opulent paraphernalia thus he himself worshiped himself for he is the supreme lord of all demigods purport sarvarhanam achute ja if achuta the supreme personality of god is worshiped then everyone is worshiped as stated in shrimad bhagavatam 431:14 yata taror mulana shechanena triptyanti tatskanda bujo pashaka prahano parachcha yatendriyanam tataiva sarvarhanam achuteja as pouring water on the root of a tree nourishes the trunk branches twigs and leaves and as supplying food to the stomach enlivens the senses and limbs of the body worshiping the supreme personality of god it satisfies the demigods who are part of that supreme personality performing yagya involves worshiping the supreme lord Here the supreme lord worshiped the supreme lord therefore it is said bhagavan atmanatmanam ej the lord worshiped himself by himself this does not of course justify the mayavad philosophy by which one thinks himself the supreme personality of godhead the jiva the living entity is always different from the supreme lord the living entities vibhinangsha never become one with the lord although mayavadis sometimes imitate the lord's worship of himself lord krishna meditated upon himself every morning as a grahastha and similarly lord ramachandra performed yagyas to satisfy himself but this does not mean that an ordinary living being should imitate the lord by accepting the process of a hung graha upasana such unauthorized worship is not recommended herein Lord Ramachandra gave the entire east to the Hota priest the entire south to the Brahma priest the west to the Advaryu priest and the north to the Udgata priest the reciter of the Samaveda in this way he donated his kingdom thereafter thinking that because the brahmanas have no material desires they should possess the entire world 
Lord Ramachandra delivered the land between the east, west, north, and south to the Acharya. After thus giving everything in charity to the prominence, Lord Ramachandra retained only his personal garments and ornaments. And similarly, the queen, Mother Sita, was left with only her nose ring and nothing else. All the brahmanas who were engaged in the various activities of the sacrifice were very pleased with Lord Ramachandra, who was greatly affectionate and favorable to the brahmanas. Thus, with melted hearts, they returned all the property received from him and spoke as follows. Purport. In the previous chapter, it was said that the prajas, the citizens, strictly followed the system of Varnashrama Dharma. The brahmanas acted exactly like brahmanas, the kshatriyas exactly like kshatriyas, and so on. Therefore, when Lord Ramachandra gave everything in charity to the brahmanas, the brahmanas being purified, wisely considered that brahmanas are not meant to possess property, to make a profit from it. <coughs> the qualifications of a brahmana are given in the Bhagavad Gita, 1842. Shamu dhamma shantir arjavam evacha, jnanam vijnanam astikyam, brahmakarma samavajam, <laughs> sabhavajam, peacefulness. Self-control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, wisdom, knowledge, and religiousness. These are the qualities by which the brahmanas work. The brahminical character offers no scope for possessing land and ruling citizens. These are the duties of a kshatriya. Therefore, although the brahmanas did not refuse Lord Ramachandra's gift, after accepting it, they returned it to the king. The brahmanas were so pleased with Lord Ramachandra's affection toward them, that their hearts melted. They saw that Lord Ramachandra, aside from being the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was fully qualified as a Kshatriya and was exemplary in character. One of the qualifications of a Kshatriya is to be charitable. A Kshatriya or ruler levies taxes upon the citizens, not for his personal sense gratification, but to give charity in suitable cases. Dhanam Ishvara Bhavaha on one hand, Kshatriyas have the propensity to rule, but on the other, they are very liberal with charity. When Maharaj Yudhishthira gave charity, he engaged Karna to take charge of distributing it. Karna was very famous as Data Karna. The word Data refers to one who gives charity very liberally. The kings always kept a large quantity of food grains in stock. And whenever there was any scarcity of grains, they would distribute grains in charity. A Kshatriya's duty is to give charity and a Brahmana's duty is to accept charity, but not more than needed to maintain body and soul together. Therefore, when the Brahmanas were given so much land by Lord Ramachandra, they returned it to him and were not greedy. Text 6. O Lord, you are the master of the entire universe. What have you not given to us? You have entered the core of our hearts and dissipated the darkness of our ignorance by your effulgence. This is the supreme gift. We, we do not need a material donation. Purport. When Dhruva Maharaj was offered a benediction by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he replied, Oh my Lord, I am fully satisfied. I do not need any material benediction. Similarly, when Prahlad Maharaj was offered a benediction by Lord Nishingadev, he also refused to accept it, and instead declared that a devotee should not be like a vanik, a mercantile man, who gives something in exchange for some profit. One who becomes a devotee for some material profit is not a pure devotee. Brahmanas are always enlightened by the Supreme Personality of Godhead within the heart. Sarvasya chaham ridisan nivishto mattak smritir jnanam apohanam cha and because the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas are always directed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are not greedy for material wealth. What is absolutely necessary, they possess, but they do not want an expanded kingdom. An example of this was given by Vamanadev. Acting as a Brahmachari, Lord Vamanadev wanted only three paces of land. Aspiring to possess more and more for personal sense gratification is simply ignorance. 
and this ignorance is conspicuous by its absence from the heart of a Brahmana or Vaishnava. O Lord, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead who have accepted the Brahmanas as your worshipable deity. Your knowledge and memory are never disturbed by anxiety. You are the chief of all famous persons within this world and your lotus feet are worshipped by sages who are beyond the jurisdiction of punishment. O Lord Ramachandra, let us offer our respectful obeisances unto you. Shukadeva Goswami continued, once while Lord Ramachandra was walking at night incognito, hiding himself by a disguise to find out the people's opinion of himself, he heard a man speaking unfavorably about his wife, Sita Devi. Speaking to his unchaste wife, the man said, You go to another man's house, and therefore you are unchaste and polluted. I shall not maintain you any more. A henpecked husband like Lord Ram may accept a wife like Sita, who went to another man's house, but I am not henpecked like him, and therefore I shall not accept you again. Shukadev Goswami said, Men with a poor fund of knowledge and a heinous character speak nonsensically. Fearing such rascals, Lord Ramachandra abandoned his wife, Sita Devi, although she was pregnant. Thus Sita Devi went to the ashram of Valmiki Muni. When the time came, the pregnant mother, Sita Devi, gave birth to twin sons, later celebrated as Lava and Kusha. The ritualistic ceremonies for their birth were performed by Valmiki Muni. O Maharaj Prikshit, Lord, Rak Lord Lakshmana had two sons named Angada and Chitraketu, and Lord Bharata also had two sons named Taksha and Pushkala. Shatrugna had two sons named Subahu and Shutasena. When Lord Bharata went to conquer all directions, he had to kill many millions of Gandharvas, who are generally pretenders. Taking all their wealth, he offered it to Lord Ramachandra. Shatrugna also killed a Rakshasha named Lavana, who was the son of Madhu Rakshasha. Thus he established in the great forest known as Maruvan, the town known as Mathura. <clears throat> 15. Being forsaken by her husband, Sita Devi entrusted her two sons to the care of Valmiki Muni. Then meditating... Upon the lotus feet of Lord Ramachandra, she entered into the earth. Purport, it was impossible for Sita Devi to live in separation for Lord, from Lord Ramachandra. Therefore, after entrusting her two sons to the care of Valmiki Muni, she entered into the earth. After hearing the news of Mother Sita's entering the earth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead was certainly aggrieved. Although he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, upon remembering the exalted qualities of Mother Sita, he could not check his grief in transcendental love. Purport, Lord Ramachandra's grief at the news of Sita Devi's entering the earth is not to be considered material. In the spiritual world also, there are feelings of separation, but such feelings are considered spiritual bliss. Grief and separation exists even in the absolute, but such feelings of separation in the spiritual world are transcendentally blissful. Such feelings are a sign of tasya prema vashyatva subhava, being under the influence of khladini shakti and being controlled by love. In the material world, such feelings of separation are only a perverted reflection. 17. The attraction between man and woman or male and female always exists everywhere, making everyone always fearful. Such feelings are present even among the controllers like Brahma and Lord Shiva and is the cause of fear for them what to speak of others who are attached to household life in this material world. Purport. <clears throat> As explained above, when the feelings of love and transcendental bliss from the spiritual world are pervertedly reflected in this material world, they are certainly the cause of bondage. As long as men feel attracted to women in this material world and women feel attracted to men, the bondage of repeated birth and death will continue. But in the spiritual world, where there is no fear of birth and death, such feelings of separation are the cause of transcendental bliss. In the absolute reality, there are varieties of feeling, but all of them are of the same quality of transcendental bliss. After Mother Sita entered the earth, Lord Ramachandra observed complete celibacy and performed an uninterrupted Agnihotra Yajna 
for 13,000 years. 19. After completing this, this sacrifice, Lord Ramachandra, whose lotus feet were sometimes pierced by thorns when he lived in Dandakaranya, <clears throat> placed those lotus feet in the hearts of those who always think of him. Then he entered his own abode, the Vaikuntha planet, beyond the Brahmajyoti. Purport. The lotus feet of the Lord are always a subject matter for meditation for devotees. Sometimes, when Lord Ramachandra wandered in the forest of Dandakaranya, thorns pricked his lotus feet. The devotees, upon thinking of this, would faint. The Lord does not feel pain or pleasure from any action or reaction in this material world, but the devotees cannot tolerate even the pricking of the Lord's lotus feet by a thorn. This was the attitude of the gopis when they thought of Krishna wandering in the forest with pebbles and grains of sand pricking his lotus feet. This tribulation in the heart of a devotee cannot be understood by karmis, jnanis, and yogis, or yogis. The devotees, who could not tolerate even thinking of the Lord's lotus feet being pricked by a thorn, were again put into tribulation by thinking of the Lord's disappearance. For the Lord had to return to his abode after finishing his pastimes in this material world. The word Atma Jyoti is significant. The Brahma Jyoti, which is greatly appreciated by jnanis or monistic philosophers who desire to enter it for liberation, is nothing but the rays of the Lord's body. Yasya Prabha Prabhapato Jagadanda Koti Koti Shreshesha Vasudari Vibhuti Binam Tad Brahma Nishkalam Anantam Ashesha Bhutam Govinda Mari Purusham Tamahamba Jami. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is endowed with great power. The glowing effulgence of his transcendental form is the impersonal Brahman, which is absolute, complete, and unlimited, and which displays the varieties of countless planets with their different opulences in millions and millions of universes. From Brahma Samhita 5.40. The Brahma Jyoti is the beginning of the spiritual world, and beyond the Brahma Jyoti are the Vaikuntha planets. In other words, the Brahma Jyoti stays outside the Vaikuntha planets, just as the sunshine stays outside the sun. To enter the sun planet, one must go through the sunshine. Similarly, when the Lord or his devotees enter the Vaikuntha planets, they go through the Brahma Jyoti. The jnanis or monistic philosophers, because of their impersonal conception of the Lord, cannot enter the Vaikuntha planets, but they also cannot stay eternally in the Brahma Jyoti. Thus, after some time, they fall again to this material world. Aruya krishchena parampadam tata patantyado nadrita yushmada angrayaha. The Vaikuntha planets are covered by the Brahma Jyoti, and therefore one cannot properly understand what those Vaikuntha planets are, unless one is a pure devotee. 20. Lord Ramachandra's reputation for having killed Ravana with showers of arrows at the request of the demigods and for having built a bridge over the ocean does not constitute the factual glory of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Ramachandra, whose spiritual body is always engaged in various pastimes. Lord Ramachandra has no equal or superior, and therefore he had no need to take help from the monkeys to gain victory over Ravana. <clears throat> Purport, as stated in the Vedas, Shvetashvatara Upanishad 6.8, Natasya karyam karanam ca vidyate, Nata samaschabhyadikascha drishyate, Parasya shaktir vividaiva shuyate, the Supreme Lord has nothing to do, and no one is found to be equal to or greater than him, for everything is done naturally and systematically by his multifarious energies. The Lord has nothing to do. Natasya karyam karanam travidyate. Whatever he does is his pastime. The Lord has no duty to perform to oblige anyone. Nonetheless, he appears to act to protect his devotees or to kill his enemies. Of course, no one can be the Lord's enemy since who could be more powerful than the Lord? 
There is actually no question of anyone's being his enemy. But when the Lord wants to take pleasure in pastimes, he comes down to this material world and acts like a human being, thus showing his wonderful, glorious activities to please the devotees. His devotees always want to see the Lord victorious in various activities. And therefore, to please himself and them, the Lord sometimes agrees to act as a human being and sometimes wonderful, uncommon pastimes being and perform wonderful uncommon pastimes for the satisfaction of the devotees. For the satisfaction of the devotees. Wonderful uncommon pastimes. Text number 21. Uh, in the Lord Ramachandra's spotless name and fame, which vanquish all sinful reactions, are celebrated in all directions, like the ornamental cloth of the victorious elephant that conquers all directions. Lord Ramachandra's spotless name and fame, which vanquish all sinful reactions, are celebrated in all directions, like the ornamental cloth of the victorious elephant that conquers all directions. Great saintly persons like Markandeya Rishi still glorify his characteristics in the assemblies of great emperors like Maharaj Yudhishthira. Similarly, all the saintly kings and all the demigods, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, worship the Lord by bowing down with their helmets. Let me offer my obeisances unto his lotus feet. Hare Krishna. Lord Ramachandra returned to his abode to which bhakti yogis are promoted. This is the place to which all the inhabitants of Ayodhya went after they served the Lord in his manifest pastimes by offering obeisances, touching his lotus feet, fully observing him as a father-like king, sitting or lying down with him like equals, or even just accompanying him. Purport, the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 4.9, Janma karma cha me divyam evam yo veti tattvataha one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. Here, this is confirmed. All the inhabitants of Ayodhya who saw Lord Ramachandra as citizens served him as servants, sat and walked with him as friends, or were somehow or other present during his reign, went back home, back to Godhead. After giving up the body, the devotee who becomes perfect in devotional service enters that particular universe where Lord Ramachandra or Lord Krishna is engaged in his pastimes. Then, after being trained to serve the Lord in various capacities in that prakatalila, the devotee is finally promoted to Sanatan Dham, the supreme abode in the spiritual world. This Sanatan Dham is also mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. One who enters the transcendental pastimes of the Lord is called Nitya Lila Pravishta. To understand clearly why Lord Ramachandra returned, it is mentioned herewith that the Lord went to that particular place where the bhakti yogis go. The impersonalists misunderstand the statements of Srimad Bhagavatam to mean that the Lord entered his own effulgence and therefore became imperson be the Lord became the two the impersonalists misunderstand the statements of Srimad Bhagavatam to mean that the Lord entered his own effulgence and therefore what's the word? Become impersonal. But the Lord is a person, and his devotees are persons. Indeed, the living entities, like the Lord, were persons in the past, they're persons in the present, and they will continue to be persons even after giving up the body. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. 23. Purusho Rama Charitam Shravanair Upadarayan Anashrim Syaparo Rajan Karma Bandharva Muchade. O King Parikshit, anyone 
who orally receives the narrations concerning the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra's pastimes will ultimately be freed from the disease of envy and thus be liberated from the bondage of fruit of activities. Purport, here in this material world, everyone is envious of someone else. Even in religious life, it is sometimes found that if one devotee has advanced in spiritual activities, other devotees are envious of him. Such envious devotees are not completely freed from the bondage of birth and death. As long as one is not completely free from the causes of birth and death, one cannot enter into the Sanatana Dham, or the eternal pastimes of the Lord. One becomes envious because of being influenced by the designations of the body. But the liberated devotee has nothing to do with the body, and therefore he is completely on the transcendental platform. A devotee is never envious of anyone, even his enemy. Because the devotee knows that the Lord is his supreme protector, he thinks, what harm can the so-called enemy do? This, thus, a devotee is confident about his protection. The Lord says, Yeyata mam prapadyante tamstataiva bajam yaham. According to the proportion of one's surrender unto me, I respond accordingly. A devotee must therefore be completely free from envy, especially of other devotees. To envy other devotees is a great offense, a Vaishnava paratha. A devotee who constantly engages in hearing and chanting, Shravana Kirtana, is certainly freed from the disease of envy, and thus he becomes eligible to go back home, back to Godhead. Text 24. Shri Rajovacha Katamcha Katamsa Bhagavan Ramo Pratrin Va Swayam Atmanaha Tasmin Va Ten Vadvartanta Praja Paurash Chaishvare Marsh Prikshit inquired from Shukadev Goswami How did the Lord conduct himself and how did he behave in relationship? with his brothers, who were expansions of his own self. And how did his brothers and the inhabitants of Ayodhya treat him? Shukadev Goswami replied, After accepting the throne of the government by the fervent request of his younger brother Bharat, Lord Ramachandra ordered his younger brothers to go out and conquer the entire world. Well, he personally remained in the capital to give audience to all the citizens and residents of the palace and supervise the governmental affairs with his other assistants. Purport. The Supreme Personality of God does not allow any of his devotees or assistants to be engaged in sense gratification. The younger brothers of Lord Ramachandra were at home enjoying the personal presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead but the Lord ordered them to go out and achieve victory all over the world. It was the custom, and this custom in some places is still current, that all other kings would have to accept the supremacy of the emperor. If the king of a small state did not accept the emperor's supremacy, there would be a fight, and the king of the small state would be obliged to accept the emperor as supreme. Otherwise, it would not be possible for the emperor to rule the country. Lord Ramachandra showed his favor to his brothers by ordering them to go out. Many of the Lord's devotees residing in Vrindavan have taken the vow not to leave Vrindavan to preach Krishna consciousness. But the Lord says that Krishna consciousness should be spread all over the world in every town and village. This is the open order of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prithivityachi jatanagaradigram sarvatra prachar hoibe moranam a pure devotee, therefore, must execute the order of the Lord and must not gratify his senses by remaining stagnant in one place, falsely proud, thinking that because he does not leave Vrindavan but chants in a solitary place, he has become a great devotee. A devotee must carry out the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Jare deka tare kaha Krishnu 
Every devotee, therefore, should spread Krishna consciousness by preaching, asking whomever he meets to accept the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord says, Sarva dharman brityaja ma mekam sharanam braja. Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. This is the order of the Lord, who speaks as the Supreme Emperor. Everyone should be induced to accept this order. For this is victory, digvijai. And it is the duty of the soldier, the devotee, to impress upon everyone this philosophy of life. Of course, those who are kanishta adhikaris do not preach, but the Lord shows mercy to them also, as he did by staying personally in Ayodhya to give audience to the people in general. One should not mistakenly think that the Lord asked his younger brothers to leave Ayodhya because he especially favored the citizens. The Lord is merciful to everyone, and he knows how to show favor to each individual person according to his capacity. One who abides by the order of the Lord is a pure devotee. One who abides by the order of the Lord is a pure devotee. It's a much easier life, too, to abide by the order of the Lord, because it's clear what the order is. At least one can clarify it if one's not sure. There's a lot of special help given uh, by Krishna to understand what his order is. He states it clearly enough. As Prabhupada in a conversation with a famous yogi who is saying that spiritual life is very mysterious and secretive, objected and said, no, it's very clear. Krishna says, man mana bhava mad bhakto, just think of me. And he said, so it's an open secret. It's open to everybody. It's, n it's not mysterious. It's not secret uh, in the way that uh, people can't find it or understand. And those who are fortunate have soft hearts. And when they hear the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and then decide to follow it, their lives become... Perfect. Can I have Bhagavad Gita, please? 13th chapter, 24th verse, in which Krishna talks about the way in which people who are open-minded but are ignorant of the orders of the Supreme Personality of God and may sometimes come in contact. Oh, thank you. feel much better. 26, sorry. 1326. Again, there are those who, although not conversant in spiritual knowledge, begin to worship the Supreme Person upon hearing about Him from others. Because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they also transcend the path of birth and death. Purport, this verse is particularly applicable to modern society because in modern society there is practically no education in spiritual matters. Some of the people may appear to be atheistic or agnostic or philosophical, but actually there is no knowledge of philosophy. As for the common man, he, if he is a good soul, then there is a chance for advancement by hearing. This hearing process is very important. Lord Chaitanya, who preached Krishna consciousness in the modern world, gave great stress to hearing because if the common man simply hears from authoritative sources, he can progress, especially according to Lord Chaitanya, if he hears the translate of vibration, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. It is stated, therefore, that all men should take advantage of hearing from realized souls and gradually become able to understand everything. The worship of the Supreme Lord will then undoubtedly take place. That's profound. It is stated, therefore, that all men should take advantage of hearing from realized souls and gradually become able to understand everything. What will you be able to understand? Everything. That's a lot. The worship of the Supreme Lord will then undoubtedly take place. How will it take place? 
Lord Chaitanya has said that in this age no one needs to change his position, but one should give up the endeavor to understand the absolute truth by speculative reasoning. Where does he say that? He says in the Bhagavatam, 11th canto, it's actually Lord Brahma, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu repeats it when, or actually Ramananda Roy repeated it, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu approved it. And let's have a look at it. Can I have the book too? We're promoting books. I'd like to have the book. One should learn to become a servant of those who are in knowledge of the Supreme Lord. What should one do? One should learn to become a servant of those who are in knowledge of the Supreme Lord. There's a special school where you can learn how to do that. If one is fortunate enough to take shelter of a pure devotee, hear from him about self-realization, and follow in his footsteps, one will be gradually elevated to the position of a pure devotee. What are the three things? Take shelter of pure devotee. And? Take shelter. Here. Follow in the footsteps. Then what happens? Gradually elevated the position of a pure devotee. That's remarkable. In this verse, particularly, the process of hearing is strongly recommended, and this is very appropriate. Although the common man is often not as capable as so-called philosophers, faithful hearing from an authoritative person will help one transcend this material existence and go back home, back to Godhead, back to home. Let's hear it for those who are not as capable. Say Haribo. Because it says right here, although the common man, let's hear it for the common man. A little more for the common man. Yeah, the common man. And then there's others who think themselves uncommon and then push away the order of the Lord as being something archaic or overly restrictive. But the common man who's very simple and takes shelter of a pure devotee hears from him and then follows in the footsteps, will gradually rise to the position of a pure devotee. And uh, Krishna's definitely appreciating those kinds of personalities. So it's a simple process to accept the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead if one is simple. And this is the famous verse that was referred to just a moment ago that uh, the Lord had um, advocated, and it's spoken by Lord Brahma in the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And if you just every day hold the Bhagavatam like this, you'll become very strong. Jnane prayasunu urapasya namanta eva jivanti san mukaritam bhavadiyavartam stane stita shutikatam tanuvan manobhir ye prayasho jita jito pyasitais trilokyam. That's 10.14.3. Those who, even while remaining situated in their established social positions, throw away the process of speculative knowledge and with their body, words, and mind, offer all respects to descriptions <clears throat> of your personality and activities, dedicating their lives to these narrations, which are vibrated by you personally and by your pure devotees, certainly conquer your lordship, although you are otherwise unconquerable by anyone within the three worlds. Within that one verse, there's uh, such a depth of philosophy that you won't find practically anywhere else, I dare say, because it, it indicates much. First of all, the process of how to connect to the Supreme Personality of Godhead practically. And also, something that one doesn't often hear about, and that is a, an intimate relationship with the Personality of Godhead and how that takes place and actually how the Lord feels himself subservient to the devotee because of, uh, he's con because of the fact that he's conquered by love. And here's the purport. Here the word udapasya clearly indicates that one should not even slightly endeavor to understand the absolute truth by the process of mental speculation, for it invariably carries one to an imperfect, impersonal understanding of God. 
The word jivanti indicates that a devotee who always hears about Lord Krishna will go back home back to Godhead, even if he can do nothing except maintain his existence and hear topics concerning the Lord. Everyone go like this. Whoa! <laughs> you want me to read it again? Yes. It's a feel-good sentence. Okay, here you go. The word jivanti indicates that a devotee who always hears about Lord Krishna will go back home, back to Godhead, even if he can do nothing except maintain his existence and hear topics concerning the Lord. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> what do you do? I just maintain my existence somehow or other, and I sit around and hear about the Lord. <laughs> That's a perfect way to live. Srila Sanatan Goswami has explained the words tanuvan mano bihi, by the body, words, and mind, in three ways. In reference to devotees, through their body, words, and mind, they are able to conquer Lord Krishna. Thus becoming perfect in Krishna consciousness, they can touch his lotus feet with their hands, call him to come with their words, and attain his direct audience within their mind simply by thinking about him. In the case of non-devotees, the words tanu van manobi refer to the word ajitta, unconquered, and indicate that those not engaged in the loving service of Lord Krishna cannot conquer the absolute truth by their bodily strength, verbal expertise, or mental power. Despite all their endeavors, the ultimate truth remains beyond their reach. In reference to the word jitaha, conquered, the words tanuvan manobi indicate that the pure devotees of Lord Krishna conquer his body, words, and mind. Lord Krishna's body is conquered because he always remains by the side of his pure devotees. Lord Krishna's words are conquered because he always chants the glories of his devotees. And Lord Krishna's mind is conquered because he always thinks about his loving devotees. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur has explained the words Tanuvan Manobi in regard to the word Namantaha. Namantaha, offering obeisances. He explains that the devotees can take full advantage of the transcendental topics of the Lord by offering all respects to those topics with their body, words, and mind. One should engage his body by touching the ground with his hands and head while offering obeisances to the topics of the Lord. I'm give it a try, right? Hare Krishna. How was that? Feel better? Okay. Me too. One should engage his body by touching the ground with his hands and head while offering obeisances to the topics of the Lord. One should engage his words by praising transcendental literatures such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Anyone? Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. And as well as the devotees who are preaching such literatures. All glories to the assembled devotees. And one should engage his mind by feeling great reverence and pleasure while hearing the transcendental topics of the Lord. So you should feel great reverence and pleasure while hearing the topics of the Lord, and that way you engage your mind. In this way, a sincere devotee who has acquired even a small amount of transcendental knowledge about Lord Krishna, can conquer him and thus go back home, back to God for eternal life at the Lord's side. We rest our case. <laughs> Bhakti's simple path of uh, devotion within the heart. If you're a simple person and you simply accept the topics of the Supreme Personality of God and offer obeisances to them, hear with rapture and appreciate the devotees with your words. Say things about the Lord. Even if you're a simple, non-scholarly person, uh, non-sophisticated, 
then you'll go back home back to Godhead because it's such a powerful process that it conquers the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It feels naturally satisfying also to offer one's obeisances to the topics of the Lord and to glorify the devotees. One can immediately feel satisfaction by that process. When we were reading in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto during Kartik, Krishna was saying how a devotee, a Vaishnava, is one who sees the Lord within everyone's heart and therefore offers obeisances to all living entities. Even dog, he said. They even offer obeisances to the dog. And when we came around on Parikram the next morning, about seven of us, and we got to Uddhavakun, there was a dog on his back, kind of rolling in the dust of Vrindavan. Vrindavan is famous for the dust. And when we saw him, all the devotees thought the same thing. They spontaneously got down and offered obeisance to the dog. He was on his back, but he jumped up and he looked at us as if no one ever did that before. <laughs> he was surprised, but we felt really satisfied because we had heard what Lord Krishna said, and then we did it spontaneously at the right time, and we just naturally felt blissful. And that's devotional service. One feels naturally blissful offering obeisances to a dog. During the reign of Lord Ramachandra, text number 26, 9, 11, 26, the streets of the capital of Ayodhya were sprinkled with perfumed water and drops of perfumed liquor thrown about by elephants from their trunks. When the citizens saw the Lord personally supervising the affairs of the city in such opulence, they appreciated this opulence very much. Purport, we have simply heard about the opulence of Ram Raja during the reign of Lord Ramachandra. Now here is one example of the opulence of the Lord's kingdom. The streets of Ayodhya were not only cleaned, but also sprinkled with perfumed water and drops of perfumed liquor, which were distributed by elephants through their trunks. There was no need of sprinkling machines, for the elephant has a natural ability to suck water through its trunk and again throw it out in a shower. <laughs> we can understand the opulence of the city from this one example. It was actually sprinkled with perfumed water. Moreover, the citizens had opportunity to see the Lord personally supervising the affairs of the state. He was not a sleeping monarch as we can understand from his activities in sending his brothers to see to affairs outside the capital and punish anyone who did not obey the emperor's orders. This is called Digvijay. The citizens were all given facilities for peaceful life and they were also qualified with appropriate attributes according to Varnashrama. As we have seen from the previous chapter, Varnashrama Gunanvitaha, the citizens were trained according to the Varnashrama system. A class of men were brahmanas, a class of men were kshatriyas, a class were vaishas, and a class were shudras. Within this scientific division, there can be no question of good. There can be no question of good citizenship. The Lord, being magnanimous and perfect in His duty, performed many sacrifices and treated the citizens as His sons. And the citizens, being trained in the varnashrama, were obedient and perfectly ordered. The entire monarchy was so opulent and peaceful that the government was even able to sprinkle the street with perfumed water, what to speak of the other management. Since the city was sprinkled with perfumed water, we can simply imagine how opulent it was in other respects. Why should the citizens not have felt happy during the reign of Lord Ramachandra? 27. The palaces, the palace gates, the assembly houses, the platforms for meeting places, the temples and all such places were decorated with golden water pots and bedecked with various types of flags. Whenever Lord Ramachandra visited auspicious, wherever Lord Ramachandra visited, auspicious welcome gates were constructed. The banana trees and betel nut trees full of, f with banana trees and betel nut trees full of fruits and flowers. The gates were decorated with various flags made of colorful cloth and with tapestries, mirrors, and garlands. 
Wherever Lord Ramachandra visited, the people approached him with paraphernalia of worship and begged the Lord's blessings. O oh Lord, they said, as you rescued the earth from the bottom of the sea in your incarnation of a, of a boar, as a boar, may you now maintain it. Thus we beg your blessings. Thereafter, not having seen the Lord for a long time, the citizens, both men and women, being very eager to see him, left their homes and got up on the roofs of, their, of the palaces, being incompletely satisfied with, uh, with being being incompletely satiated with seeing the face of the lotus-eyed Lord Ramachandra, they showered flowers upon him. Thereafter, Lord Ramachandra entered the palace of his forefathers. Within the palace were various treasures and valuable wardrobes. The sitting place on the two sides of the entrance door, sides of the entrance door were made of coral. The yards were surrounded by pillars of Vaiduria money. The floor was made of highly polished Markatamani, and the foundation was made of marble. The entire palace was decorated with flags and garlands and bedecked with valuable stones, shining with a celestial effulgence. The palace was fully decorated with pearls and surrounded by lamps and incense. The men and women within the palace all resembled demigods and were decorated with various ornaments, which seemed beautiful because of being placed on their bodies. Lord Ramachandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, chief of the best learned scholars, resided in that palace with his pleasure potency, Mother Sita, and enjoyed complete peace. Without transgressing the religious principles, Lord Ramachandra, whose lotus feet are worshipped by devotees in meditation, enjoyed with all the paraphernalia of transcendental pleasure for as long as needed. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the ninth canto, 11th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled, Lord Ramachandra Rules the World. Chapter 12. Shukadev Goswami said, and this is called the dynasty of Kush, the son of Ramachandra was Kusha. The son of Kusha was Atiti, the son of Atiti was Nishada, and the son of Nishada was Nabha. The son of Nabha was Pundarika, and from, from Pundarika came a son named Shema Dhanva. Do we have the um, Sanatana Goswami's prayers up to the Srimad Bhagavatam now available? Shraddha? Huh? Are they there? Before I read this chapter, I wanted to read for us to read these five prayers together because there's a few names in this chapter. Thank you. That's what, when you got a pundit in the room, stuff happens by magic. This is from the Srimad Bhagavata Mahima Stotram from the Krishna Lila Stava. Sarva Shastra Bhipiyusha Sarva Vedaika Satpala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya Sarva Lokaika Drikprada O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabho, Kali Dhan, Kali Dhan Todi Taditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam, you were the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You were the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya, Prema Varsha, Sharaya cha sarvada sarva sevyaya Sri Krishnaya namostume. I bow down to you who are supremely, supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna himself. 
So that's a prema varshi aksharaya te. That uh, every syllable, the syllables, every syllable in, in the Srimad Bhagavatam pours down a flood of prema. Text number 415. Altogether, Mad eka bando mat sangin, mat goro man mahadana, man nishtaraka mat bhagya, mat ananda namostute. My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. 416. Asadhu sad oh wait okay ready Asadhu sadhu ta dayin ati nicho chatakara hana mucha kadachin mam prem narit katayos pura O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly O exalter of the most fallen please never leave me always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love Shilasanat and Goswami ki jai Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Keep that in mind. Text 2. The son of Shema Danva was Devanika. Devanika's son was Aniha. Aniha's son was Pariyatra. And Pariyatra's son was Balastala. The son of Balastala, Balastala was Vajranaba, who was said to have been born from the effulgence of the sun god. The son of Vajranaba was Sagana, and his son was Vidriti. The son of Vidriti was Hiranyanaba, who became a disciple of Jaimini and became a great Acharya of Mystic Yoga. It is from Hiranyagarbha, excuse me, Hiranyanaba, that the great saint Yagyavalta, Yagyavalkya learned the highly elevated system of Mystic Yoga known as Adhyatma Yoga, which can loosen the knots of material attachment in the heart. Hey, you can teach that at Stanford. <laughs> the son of Hiranyanaba was Pushpa, and the son of Pushpa was <laughs> Dhruvasandi. The son of Dhruvasandi was Sudarshana, whose son was Agnivarna. The son of Agnivarna was Shigra, and his son was Maru. Now, I'm going to test and see if you remember all these. Because <laughs> I would expect that from this group. Six, having achieved perfection in the power of mystic yoga, Madhu still lives in a place known as Kalapa Gram. At the end of Kali Yuga, he will revive the lost Surya dynasty by begetting a son. Purport, at least 5,000 years ago, Srila Shukadev Goswami ascertained the existence of Maru and Kalapa Gram and said that Maru, having achieved a yoga siddha body, would continue to exist until the end of Kali Yuga, which is calculated to continue for 432,000 years. Such is the perfection of mystic power. By controlling the breath, the perfect yogi can continue his life for as long as he likes. Sometimes we hear from the Vedic literature that some personalities from the Vedic age such as Vyasadeva and Ashvatthama, are still living. Here we understand that Maru is also still living. We are sometimes surprised that a mortal body can live for such a long time. The explanation of this longevity is given here by the word Yoga Siddha. If one becomes perfect in the practice of yoga, he can live as long as he likes. The demonstration of some trifling Yoga Siddha does not constitute perfection. Here the factual example of perfection, a Yoga Siddha, can live as long as he likes. Seven, from Maru was born a son named Prashushruta, and from Prashushruta came Sandhi, from Sandhi came Amarshana, and from Amarshana a son named Mahasvan. From Mahasvan, Vishvabahu took his birth. From Vishvabahu came a son named Prasenajit. From Prasenajit came Takshaka, and from Takshaka came Brihadbala, who was killed in a fight by your father. 
All these kings of the dynasty of Ikshvaku have passed away. Now please listen as I describe the kings who will be born in the future. From Brihadbala will come Brihadrana. The son of Brihadrana will be Urukriya, who will have a son named Vatsavridha. Vatsavridha will have a son named Prativyoma, and Prativyoma will have a son named Banu, from whom Divaka, a great commander of soldiers, will take birth. Okay. So what we're, what we're hearing here is a, a lineage that coming after Ramachandra from his son. And it's important because um, the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, is leading to the having us put our full attention on Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And we find that anyone in relationship with Krishna or Lord Ramachandra is important to the devotees, Tadiya. So, the other th way to consider, as one's going through various pages of the Bhagavatam, and there's only two more pages here, is that the, uh, the observance of hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam in its entirety is uh, one of the greatest kinds of practice of Bhakti Yoga. Should I keep going? Thereafter, from Divaka will come a son named Sahadev, and from Sahadev a great hero named Brihadashva. From Brihadashva will come Banuman, and from Banuman will come Pratik, Pratiksha, Pratikashva. The son of Pratikashva will be Supratika. Thereafter, from Supratika will come Marudev. From Marudev, Sunakshatra. From Sunakshatra, Pushkar, and from Pushkar, Antariksha. The son of Antariksha will be Sutapa, and his son will be Amitrajit. From Amitrajit will come a son named Brihadvaja. From Brihadraja will come Barhi, and from Barhi will come Kritanjaya. The son of Kritanjaya will be known as Rananjaya, and from him will come a son named Sanjaya. From Sanjaya will come Shakya, from Shakya will come Shudhodha, and from Shudhodha will come L Langala, from Langala will come Prasenajit, and from Prasenajit, Shudraka. From Shudraka will come Ranaka, and from Ranaka will come Surata, and from Surata will come Sumitra, ending the dynasty. This is a description of the dynasty of Brihadbala. The last king in the dynasty of Ikshvaka will be Sumitra. After Sumitra, there will be no more sons in the dynasty of the sun god, and thus the dynasty will end. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the ninth canto, twelfth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The Dynasty of Kush, the son of Lord Ramachandra. Hare Krishna. No one can say that we're not thorough in our hearing of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And now we'll take a few reflections, that is, anything that you've heard so far that's stuck in your mind from our readings today. And if you don't have that, we'll ask you to remember all the names in the last chapter. Yes, Naveen and Nirada Prabhu, and then Srivast Prabhu, and then up to Shraddha. Hare Krishna. Simply by maintaining one's existence and hearing about the Lord, one can attain the perfection of going back home, back to God. Yeah, why did you like that? Because it gives hope. It shows that if that's all you can do, that's good enough. And everything else is extra. So, sometimes we may fail at a few things or struggle with a few things, but if we can focus on the essential and get that in on a daily basis, then Krishna is pleased. Do you all find that helpful and makes, gives you, makes you more hopeful? Yes. Gaur Pray Manande Haribo. 
Thank you, Naveena, for bringing that out. Now pass it back to Sh Srivast already has the mic. Go ahead. So, Prabhuji, um, we hear that Maru in the purport is going to live until the end of Kali Yuga and the yogis can um, <clears throat> extend their lifespan by their breaths. So, is the death of a particular person by destiny ordained at a particular time or is there some way you can extend the lifespan or decrease the lifespan based on the activities? Well, everyone has their allotted time. In these cases, there's... Uh, anyway, just to stick with the basic question, uh, it's, it's a bit of a mystery because everyone... No one knows when they'll leave this world. And we take it that you have an allotted amount of time. But it's also in context of the Bhagavatam and Krishna's pastimes, we see that Krishna may, for various purposes, maintain someone for a long period of time in order to carry on the pastimes. But generally we understand that we have a, a fixed number of breaths to take within this lifetime. But it's also mentioned by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur that pure devotees of the Lord, because they are fully surrendered, their prarabdha karma, which is manifest by the, in the form of this material body, is nullified by the process of devotional service, but then Krishna maintains their material, apparently material body, just so they can go on doing devotional service. So there are various adjustments that can be made by the arrangement of Krishna. But by one's ordinary destiny, there's a certain number of breaths. And one shouldn't be very surprised when they suddenly run out. Because that's something Krishna says at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, for one is born, death is certain. And therefore, one should always be in preparatory mode because we can't assume that we have any extra breaths other than the ones we've been mercifully given already. Thank you. Thank you. Shraddha? So, two things, Maharaj. Um, one was that um, you, had, you had read that one who abides by the order of the Lord is a pure devotee. And um, I was thinking about something that I re read about, you know, five, six years ago. It was um, uh, a, a nun, I think her name was Mother Teresa. She was from Spain. And she was here on this world around the same time when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also there on the same duration. And she had mentioned that, um, that uh, in trying to obey the orders of the Lord, we have to disobey ourselves. And therein lies the difficulty. <laughs> So I was just reflecting on that, that you know how it is difficult to become a pure devotee. It might you reminded me also that one of the instructions we've gotten from one of our acharyas, Ashila Gorkishore Das Babaji, whom we visit, or is it, no, um, Shila Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj, whose samadhi and bhajan kutir we visit in Navadvi Pichir, is that one should complete, before the sun goes down, one's prescribed number of rounds. And then he goes on to say, even at the risk of one's own life. <laughs> As this sounds normal to say, one should complete one's prescribed rounds, but then he said, even at the risk of one's own life. So, should take it that seriously, following an instruction and not simply say, oh, I've received it, it's not that important. But if one takes the simple things and applies them strictly, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, take the simple path, but follow it very strictly. Don't say, Bhakti is simple, therefore, I will be spontaneous and not follow. That won't uh, help as much as one who adheres very strictly to the process as given by Krishna and the spiritual master. 
even though it's a simple thing and one may be simple, one will attain, will get great progress from that. You had another point and then Gandharvika. So Mahat, I actually had a question. Um, you had also read that, um, O oh Lord, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead who have accepted the Brahmanas as your worshipable deity. And um, so if you can elaborate a little bit on that, like how does Krishna, what is worshipable deity for Krishna? Like Krishna is our worshipable deity. Cows and the Brahmins. Go Brahmana Hitaya Cha. So the devotees and those who follow uh, Krishna's Instructions is their life and soul, which is the characteristic of a Brahmin, become very dear to him. So we see in the case of Sudama, who was a Brahmin who came to see Krishna. When he came into the assembly of Krishna's palace, then Krishna worshipped him. And that's his soft-hearted nature. And he reciprocates with his devotees who are surrendered to him. The Brahmins don't have anything else in the world. As was mentioned, Ramachandra gave everything to the Brahmins and they accepted it. And then they said, we don't really need anything. We're satisfied. They gave it all back. And for those, Krishna says in the Gita, nanyas chintayantomam yejana paryupasate tesham nityabdyuktanam yoga kshem mambaham yaham. To those who are just fully absorbed in me and they don't have any other attachments or agenda, I just carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. There's a very close relationship for those who are fully dependent on Krishna, and that's the characteristic of a brahmana. They don't have any other agenda in this world. They don't hide anything. They're very simple, and they're satisfied by worshiping Krishna. So he, he's grateful. That's one of his qualities, as mentioned by Rupa Goswami in the Nectar Devotion. Krishna's grateful. And if someone does a little service, Krishna always remembers it. What to speak of someone's whole life is dedicated to him. Then, yogic shemam bahamiyaham, Krishna says emphatically and out of love, said, I personally take care of that person because uh, he or she becomes so dear to me. Is there another thing? Okay, Gandharvika and then Suvrata Kripa. I had uh, two points, Prabhu. The first one is the feel-good verse, the 10, 14, 3, that just by dedicating our lives for hearing, we call yeah, 10, Krishna. 14, 3. 10, just 14, 3. Just by dedicating 3. our lives to hearing. Yeah. And I also like the verse which promised that by hearing the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra, uh, the envy will go away from our hearts, which is the most difficult to give up. So th those are the two things. Yeah. And Prabhupada said, sometimes even one might envy one's own god brothers. It's possible for that to happen. So, yeah, such benefit is there by hearing, and then the envy will, in one's heart, will dissipate, as if somebody's non-envious. Then they can actually enjoy the nectar of life at every moment. What else? Yes, Radha Kripa. Guru uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, when you were reading the uh, dynasty in the detail, this is the first time I never thought then when it is going to finish. Because uh, in the previous time, whenever I reach such section, I always try, oh my God, this is so long. When it, this is going to end? And I was just reflecting that when you were reading each, each one of those names uh, with such a Care. So I, I just felt like one needs to hear uh, the importance uh, from the right source, uh, then only we can value it. So I just wanted to thank That's you. That's why I read Sanatana Goswami's prayers to the Srimad Bhagavatam and emphasized that every syllable is important. And if one takes that meticulous approach to reading the Bhagavatam and goes through it again and again and considers every syllable to be transcendental, one can enter into the right mood. Besides, just as when you go on Govardhan Parikram, you may take off walking around the hill. This is a sacred hill. Devotees do this worship by walking around. It's called Padasevanam. Sometimes the ground is very rough. In other places, it's very smooth. But you can't stop. 
just because it's a little rough, you have to keep going. Same thing when you're going through Bhagavatam, you may come to some section. This is very philosophical. I don't understand all these elements merging into one another. And it doesn't matter. It's the Bhagavatam. You just keep reading it. <laughs> you don't skip over this and go to that, but you just keep going. It's a parikram. You have to worship the syllables. And as you do, Krishna reveals, like in that chapter, there was some uh, definite nectar there that was hidden that one might miss. It's like, oh, you know, and <laughs> you actually miss some point that can change your life. One, one syllable in the Bhagavatam can change your life. Who was next? Oh, you had some from the internet, okay. Is it from overseas? Uh, no. <laughs> Is it from in town? Is it from one of our devotees in our congregation? Yes. <laughs> okay, now everyone gets to guess who it is. <laughs> and it, no. Okay, no. Sudeep Hansapriya, no, no, no. Three more no. guesses and you're out. Okay, no. go ahead. No. 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 One more. No. <laughs> All right. Everyone's disqualified. Go ahead. This is from Bhaktin Poonam. Bhaktin Poonam, Haribo. And she's, she's on the Facebook, and she offers you her obeisances, and she's thanking you for, um, for the wonderful reading. Thanks for listening. And she has appreciated a point. A devotee must therefore be completely free from envy, especially of other devotees. To envy other devotees is a great offense, a Vaishnava aparad. A devotee who constantly engages in hearing and chanting Shravan Kirtan is certainly freed from the disease of envy and thus he becomes eligible to go back home, back to Godhead. That's a worthy occupation. Thank you, Bhakti Poonam. Yeah, for bringing that up. It's a, it's a worthy goal to continually hear if with the objective of purifying oneself, of biting envy so one can become pure-hearted. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. I re I'm really grateful you brought out those prayers and before reading such a section because the tendency is to okay, <laughs> flip over and then oh, all you already know that or it's just a bunch of names. You mentioned that every syllable can be uh, if it can if it can pierce. And I was just remembering several um, weeks back, somebody was mentioning that Burijan Prabhu, I think, brought out a very small booklet called Prayerful Reading. So before reading, uh, offer some prayers, and then whatever time you have, just read it, even if you don't understand it. Srila Prabhupada books, and then for sure one syllable, one bunch of words, or one line will definitely hit you, and that's it, you have connected collected a jewel for that day. And he writes that if you collect many such jewels, then soon you'll be a rich man. So I really like that, yeah, one syllable, if, if that can hit, got a jewel for the day. Let's hear it for Burjan Prabhu. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Yeah, beautiful. This is mentioned also in the Padyavali that just as a, a materialistic person collects coins and then counts them again and again, the devotees collect these jewels from the Bhagavatam and they count them again and again and again as their real wealth. And in the same mood, with the same kind of greed, only it's spiritual greed for collecting these spiritual points. And now we're going to have a little kirtan just after this message from the internet. This message from Facebook, Rameshwar Prabhu. Oh, we've got Rameshwar Prabhu here. So this is a great uh, test of how one's hearing and chanting going. If you can attract the great souls to come into the assembly or even cast their glance, then you know that the hearing and chanting is starting to reach a certain level. So we should take a deep breath and appreciate that he's joined us today. And he's appreciating a text from what you had read, while Lord Rama walked this earth, every resident 
which is abundantly flowering plants and trees, freshly flowing rivers everywhere, joyful creatures in each species, all perfectly happy, perfectly protected. In this full spiritually awakened God consciousness and God-centered world under his divine transcendental reign. Yes, thank you very much. And I also remembered that uh, purport where Prabhupada speaks about the way in which devotees are digvijais. They go out and they conquer every direction, just as Ramachandra sent out his family members to conquer the various directions. So Prabhupada then compares that to the devotees who go out on behalf of Lord Chaitanya as great warriors to conquer all directions. Cupertino and San Ramon, Mountain Home, Mountain House, that's even better, Mountain House, Mountain View, Dublin, San Francisco, Fremont, where? Pleasanton, Sunnyvale, San Jose, Santa Clara, Palo Alto, Milpitas, Burlingame, no one's been up there yet. <laughs> you know, when the devotees are calculating these, you know, where they're sending out parties, this is the Digvijay going out to conquer on behalf of Lord Ramachandra. Berkeley, San Bruno, and when Prabhupada signed his letters, wherever he was in the world, he did it in military language. He would write at the top, Camp New Dwarka, wherever he was, he called it camp, because he was in this mode of military uh, excursion on behalf of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we should also be in that mood, Prabhupada says, and this is a better service than simply staying home and hearing and chanting, but one should hear and chant profusely, constantly, which you can actually surprisingly do even more when you're going out to distribute it, it increases your capacity and the momentum so you can do it even more. And once you go out here, there, and everywhere and conquer on behalf of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I just came back from the Laguna Beach, the uh, beautiful jewel of a temple. It's the most beautiful of all the ISKCON properties in the world, perched right there over the Pacific Ocean. And uh, within that temple, there are uh, that temple overflowing with pure devotees who are hearing and chanting around the clock and going out, spreading Krishna consciousness all over Orange County and beyond. And also, although I haven't been there yet, uh, Tukaram Prabhu has also established an ashram in Long Beach where there are very serious uh, students of Krishna consciousness living, working together. There's a restaurant there they opened. Uh, it's a very successful project there in Southern California. Such a pleasure to be there. Also, while I was there, I took the opportunity, Rupanuga Prabhu, who's a um, uh, professor at Chapman College, he uh, teaches management studies, but he's greatly in demand all over Southern California. People want to hire him for projects and things like that. And uh, just so happened that one of the places that I wanted to see down there, which is called Saddleback Church, is a, a place that he had strong connections to because they actually, he did a study there and they asked him to do, do some consulting for, for them. In any case, he had, that had been 10 years ago. So it's the first time he'd been there in a decade. It's the first time I'd been there ever except for Easter last year, I drove by, but it was too crowded to get out of the car, especially in a dodi. I didn't want to freak anybody out. <laughs> so we went there to look, and I was very impressed. I'd read Rick Warren's book about uh, the purpose-driven church and all that he had gleaned over the uh, 25 years before he wrote the book about how to build a spiritual community. But then I saw it in action. I took multiple pictures, collected every piece of paper and anything of, that I, I could take, and... Uh, that showed the kind of um, consideration they put into developing that community. Of course, it didn't come easily. It took them 
over 20 years, they moved from one small place to the next, getting a little bit larger, and he used to say that anybody could find them uh, was intelligent because they moved so much. At one point, they had their little church in a movie, in a movie theater because that's all they c could find at the time. But now uh, you'll find a really um, well-designed, it's a, the size of a, a medium-sized college campus, maybe a large-sized college campus, with multiple facilities for different kinds of people. As one of the people there, as I was asking uh, people there who work there and so forth, their experiences and more information and so forth, one of them said each one, same message, different music, to accommodate people's particular psychophysiological natures. In any case, the lesson I brought back with me is we're on a similar track here that is going from one place to the next, utilizing whatever Krishna gives us to the full ability, to our full capacity. And when we reach that full capacity, that is complete um, um, care and taking care of what Krishna has given us, then uh, he provides us more facility. And um, take, making incremental improvements at every step. One of the, I, I did bring back a lot of information that I'd like to go over with all of you to digest and look at ways in which um, they've very much uh, accommodated the, the entire population of Southern California and beyond in uh, ways that I would like to implement here as well for the sake of opening people's hearts to the process of Krishna consciousness. And that's just one thing I have to report, but because we're out of time, you're lucky I won't say more at this particular point, but it's something that I wanted to bring up so that you'll ask me about it, and then I can pull out all the stuff I have and present it. And um, we also welcome the devotees who have come here today. It's not easy at the time of afternoon and on a Wednesday to drive all the way here, to park, then to come in and sit uh, to hear and chant. So you're very exalted souls. And that goes for all of you online too. Please let's uh, thank all the devotees that joined us online. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We have big desires to expand the vibration uh, in much bigger ways. And it always does if we simply purify it. So let's keep going on with our strict sadhana, follow the simple path very strictly, and try to expand the glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam and all the Prabhupada's books around the world and the holy name in every uh, street corner, if possible. It is possible. Gaur Premanande Haribo. And now we have the opportunity to dance, which doesn't come up that often in normal day life. Uh, so we're going to move everything out of the way and open up the space on the floor. Please leave a, a, a corridor between Prabhupada's Vyasa sign and the altar, and then uh, feel free to stretch out and dance as we um, observe the evening artik for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Gaur Premanande Bo. Not to the arm, Marman. 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 Hey, not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman.